Okay, so our, our last speaker today is Artyom Chernikov from UCLA, who will speak about recognizing groups and fields in attached geometry and model theory. Uh, thank you very much, Antoine, and uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, first of all, I just want to say that it is a big honor for me to speak uh, in this meeting in honor of Udi Khrushchevsky. Uh, and um, all of the themes basically of this talk uh, are deeply influenced by his work. Uh, over pioneered uh, by his work, uh, so so I think uh, I'm happy to present it here. Uh, so first of all, uh, I'm going to talk about some connections uh, between uh, a big theme in model theory, uh, which is uh, the recognition of uh, various algebraic objects such as groups and fields from uh, generic data or from geometry of certain independence relations uh, in, a, in, in, in a structure, and uh, some similar questions about extremal configurations uh, for various asymptotic combinatorial questions, uh, counting um, uh, intersections of definable sets uh, or just algebraic varieties, for example, with grids, uh, where, uh, so, okay, so on the model theory side, this is often described uh, as the trichotomy principle. It has many incarnations in various settings. Uh, and what it typically says is that uh, in a sufficiently tame model theoretically uh, context, so for example, certain strongly minimal or certain stable structures uh, or arbitrary or minimal structures, there is this uh, strong uh, trichotomy into uh, trivial behavior or uh, linear behavior or called modular behavior, which is essentially uh, something like a vector space or uh, that there are some fields around. Um, and uh, turns out that in this kind of nice uh, tame model theoretic context, uh, the asymptotic sizes of the intersections uh, of definable sets uh, with finite grids uh, they reflect the trichotomy principle. So uh, I will give you a couple of examples where uh, just this asymptotics uh, of counting edges in definable graphs or hypergraphs, they detect presence of uh, certain algebraic structures. And uh, okay, like I already mentioned, uh, it's known that ex examples achieving maximal bounds uh, in combinatorics often tend to be uh, robust and have some algebraic structure. So uh, here I'll discuss uh, inverse theorem of this kind, which tell you that uh, it has to come from some algebraic structure in some instances. So uh, the first uh, topic I want to discuss is uh, expansion. Uh, so this is a quite uh, a fundamental, uh, some product principle observed by Radio Simiredi originally, uh, tells us that uh, there exists some absolute constant C such that uh, for any finite set of reals, um, if I look at the set of all sums from the set, so these are all elements of the form A plus A or A plus B for A, B in A, and similarly for the product set, so these are all elements of the form A times B for A, B in A, uh, then at least one of the sets has to be significantly larger than A itself. Or by significantly larger in this talk, I will typically mean that uh, the power has to increase by uh, some value. Uh, yeah, so at least one of these two sets must be big. So in some sense, it gives you uh, an explicit quantitative um, uh, uh, weakness to the, 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 the fact that the plus and times don't interact very much. Yeah? So uh, this was refined in various, uh, um, so there's a, it's a whole industry by now determining the, uh, the optimal bound in this uh, expansion. Uh, I think the current record is um, the, uh, of the form four thirds plus epsilon. So we can replace this one plus C by four thirds plus epsilon for some sufficiently small epsilon. Uh, and conjecturally, this should be essentially quadratic. So uh, exponent is of the form two, two minus epsilon for any epsilon. Uh, and this is open, uh, very much open. Now, 
Uh, there's a generalization from just considering uh, the sum and the product uh, separately. We can consider polynomials. Okay, so you have polynomial in two variables, f uh, of some given degree d. Uh, and then uh, a remarkable theorem of uh, Elikesh and Ranyai demonstrates that uh, we still have an expansion here. So for any pair of sets a and b of, of size n, sets of real numbers, if I look at the image, so this is the set of all uh, numbers of the form f of a, b for a and a, b and b. So again, we get uh, expansion. So the power is strictly greater than one, uh, unless uh, we're in the exceptional case uh, where essentially only one operation connects uh, the variables. So either uh, our polynomial f is additive, so of the form g of h of x plus i of y, or multiplicative, so the same but with multiplication, for some univariate polynomials j h i. Sorry, Artyom, what is omega yes. d with index d? Oh, this just means that this grows uh, as uh, some absolute constant, uh, c depending on d in this case. Yeah, so for some constant c, depending only on d, uh, times uh, n to the power of four thirds. Ah, okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah. So the, unless our polynomial. Uh, Okay, so oh, let me rephrase it. So maybe as long as our polynomial uh, mixes the operations in any non-trivial way, uh, then it exhibits expansion. Okay. Um, now, what is the role of these uh, two groups, the additive for the multiplicative group? Uh, so a remarkable result of Elikesh and Sabo uh, provides uh, a conceptual explanation for the role of the groups in, in this theorem. Of, of the algebraic groups in the theorem. Uh, there are many th uh, variants of this result, so let me just uh, present it. It's a slight variant of uh, the original result of allocation sabo. So assume we have an algebraic surface, uh, uh, R of x1, x2, x3. Uh, and uh, for example, in the previous result, in the allocation theorem, we, uh, we, we could have considered f of x, y is equal to z. Yeah, so this would be the... Uh, uh, mm, so in, in viewing it like this, uh, we will see that Elikesh Rania is essentially a special case of this. So, uh, and assume that we have uh, an additional condition that the projection onto any two coordinates is finite to one. Then exactly one of the following two cases must happen. So the first case, uh, if that expansion happens or uh, rephrased when we're talking about the graph of the polynomial, uh, we are saying that uh, there's a power saving here. So there exists some positive gamma, uh, can be very small. There are some, of course, some estimates by now, uh, such that for any finite sets, AI, all of size N, if we look at the intersection of this uh, surface R with an N by N by N grid, then the total number um, uh, of such triples, which are on the surface, is at most N to the power two minus gamma. So it's strictly less than two. Of course, n square would be the trivial bound, the trivial upper bound, uh, but what we get is a non-trivial trade-off. So it's strictly less than, uh, than square, okay? So this is the first possibility. And if you look again at this uh, uh, special case, when we consider uh, some polynomial f in two variables, then the expansion for f corresponds exactly to power saving uh, for, for, for r defined in this way, yeah? Or, uh, this uh, algebraic surface, so the second possibility, is that this algebraic surface is um, uh, tightly connected uh, to, to an algebraic group, uh, commutative algebraic group. So in fact, in one dimension, it's even more explicit. So the second possibility is that locally, there exists some open sets UI and some V contain a neighborhood of zero and analytic bijections on each of the coordinates x1, x2, x3, uh, such that uh, up to applying this coordinate wise uh, bijections, we get that R is essentially just the relation uh, x1 plus x2 plus x3 is equal to zero for all uh, uh, triples in, in, in this neighborhoods, in this open sense, okay? So we get that up to this um, uh, coordinate wise bijections, this is essentially the graph of addition in, a, in an abelian group. Okay, um, so 
this result uh, has um, led to quite a lot of activity in the last uh, decade. So uh, there's a lot of various generalizations, extensions, related results. Uh, so on this slide, I'm trying to list them. Uh, hopefully, I'm not forgetting uh, too much. So we can consider a generalization of this result when, first of all, now we have a product of R sets, x1 through xr. Uh, each of uh, arbitrary dimension m, so it doesn't have to be one dimensional like on the previous flight anymore. Uh, and the arity of the relation is now r instead of just three like on the previous uh, slide. Okay. And we still have the same uh, condition that uh, projection onto any r minus one coordinates is finite to one. Uh, and again, the question becomes whether uh, there's this dichotomy between uh, power saving and um, uh, close connection to, to a group, okay? Uh, so the original result of Elikers Sabo, they obtained um, uh, a result for RIT3, uh, arbitrary dimension of the coordinates of the sets XI, uh, and they were working over uh, complex numbers, in which case uh, one has to replace this bijection by finite to finite algebraic correspondences. Um, oh, and also when one talks about higher dimensional um, uh, sets, so when the dimension of xi uh, is greater than one, one also has to take into account uh, grids uh, in general position. So the count part now is only concerned with grids in general position. Uh, so what do I mean by this? Uh, we mean by this that now we have the sets uh, ai subset of xi uh, in general position, meaning that uh, intersecting ai with any subset of smaller dimension a definable set W of smaller dimension um, is finite. So for all W with dimension W uh, less than M. Okay. So it's a technical thing which is uh, um, necessary for higher for the higher dimensional situation. Well, at least in this theorem. Uh, okay. So then there were various generalizations and refinements. Um, by a number of authors, but let me uh, stress uh, the first connection uh, uh, probably of, of this result to model theory uh, is due to Khrushchevsky, who gave a new proof of the Elikir Sabo theorem, uh, working first of all with the finite dimension, uh, it's called so the core pseudo finite dimension delta. And uh, very importantly, he recognized that uh, at the core of this result is in fact uh, modularity of certain per geometry associated to this relation, uh, which, uh, which is this kind of uh, notion of linearity in model theory. So I'll uh, get back to it in a second, but um, this was um, a very important realization. And then uh, this work was pushed further uh, by, by Bayes and Bruyard, who gave uh, uh, a generalization in the case of algebraically closed fields for arbitrary RIT and dimension. Uh, moreover, they recognize that even in higher dimension, groups are abelian. Uh, but the, yeah, but, the, but maybe one slight disadvantage of the method is that um, it doesn't provide bounds on, on, on power saving gamma. So here, let me remind gamma is this uh, power saving that we get for the count. Well, the notion of general position is also slightly different. Um, okay. Then there was a lot of um, other related work. So for example, uh, there was work by Buch Zimmerman and Tao who addressed similar questions about expanding polynomials uh, over finite fields, uh, where a situation, well, there are some similarities, but there are also some uh, serious distinctions. Um, and uh, there are various other generalizations that I mentioned here. Uh, so now I want to state a result uh, with Kobe Peterson and Sergei Starchenko, where we give an analog for o minimal structures on the one hand, uh, and also for a certain class of stable structures, namely those stable structures which have distal expansion. And I'll return to it also in a second. So let me first state uh, a special case of this the one dimensional case in a minimal structures. So assume uh, we have a relation R of arbitrary arity. So arity is little r, greater or equal than three. And assume that M is an arbitrary or minimal expansion of the field of reals. So in this theorem, it's, uh, it matters that uh, we expand in the field of reals. Uh, 
with the same assumption such that the projection of R to any R minus one coordinates is finite to one. Then we have uh, this dichotomy that exactly one of the following holds. So in the first case, we have that for any uh, finite grid, so for any choice of uh, sets AI of size N for each of the coordinates, uh, when we look at the intersection of R with this finite grid, then again, we get a uh, power saving. So the maximal exponent would be uh, R minus one. So we get something better. And we have uh, moreover explicit estimates on this. Uh, so uh, yeah, we have explicit uh, estimates on gamma. Uh, this is case one. And the other possibility is that again, uh, our relation R is very closely connected. So up to some coordinate wise homomorphisms, it is uh, essentially the relation X1 plus X2, et cetera, plus XR is equal to zero. Yeah. So we get uh, a generalization of this to any number of coordinates. So this is a very easy to state a one dimensional case. Uh, yes, there is a question. Can I ask both in this and also in the original theorem, do you get mm -hmm. any degree of control over what happens outside the, the UI? Uh, so no, in the minimal case, it has to be essentially local. Um, it, it, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. In the stable case, it's a bit a more global statement, but uh, but in the minimal case, there are examples like you can have, for example, a group. You know, you can have a group on one interval, and next to it, you have an interval with uh, without a group, for, for example. And then, mm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's usually in the, in, in the minimal case, this, this has uh, necessarily has to be a local uh, local type of statement. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and so now the full or minimal case um, uh, is a generalization of uh, what I just said. Uh, so let me just stress uh, what has to change in the general case. So again, we have a relation R, a subset of some product of definable sets, uh, where now the dimension of each of the sex size is arbitrary. Um, but we still have the same assumption yeah, that the projection of R to any R minus one coordinates is finite to one. Uh, then one of the following calls. So I'm not longer claiming that uh, uh, the cases are uh, incompatible necessarily. So what we have is that for any choice of, of a grid, but now in general position, and this is uh, the same sense as I defined earlier. So this means that each, uh, we have a bound on, um, well, we are requiring that uh, this grid AI uh, whenever we pick a, a set of some definable set of smaller dimension, it can only cut out a bounded number of points from each of these uh, of these uh, sets in the grid. So intersecting R with such uh, grids in general position, we get uh, again power saving, and we have explicit uh, estimates on gamma. They're not optimal, but um, yeah, that that getting optimal bounds might be very difficult actually. Um, even in the same algebraic case. Or the second possibility is that again, locally, up to uh, coordinate wise homeomorphisms, uh, our relation is essentially the graph of addition in some uh, abelian group, abelian Lie group of dimension M. Okay, so we get, uh, so we get a generalization to any number of coordinates and, um, and dimension of the sets. Uh, now, just a couple of remarks about this um, result. So first of all, uh, our theorem, this is just a special case when, uh, when our structure, our minimal structure is actually an expansion of the field of reals. Uh, what we really get is a correspondence to some type definable group uh, in the result. And then, then we can get Lie groups uh, if you're working over the reals with some uh, standard to minimality arguments. Uh, proofs, now all existing proofs of, um, of this uh, like subot type theorems, they usually involve uh, a combination of two, uh, two ingredients, uh, where one ingredient is a, a, some kind of simulated rotor style bounds uh, for uh, graphs definable in a minimal structures or even more generally in distal structures. Uh, and the second ingredient uh, is a, uh, one needs to use some, some variant of the abelian group configuration uh, uh, theorem of Zilber and Khrushchevsky. Uh, 
uh, on recognizing groups from a generic chunk. Uh, or in, in the minimal case, we also uh, uh, had to get a, a certain purely combinatorial version. So I want to say a couple of words about these ingredients now. Uh, so the first one, recognizing groups. Okay, So it's a very purely combinatorial variant of the abelian group configuration. Assume you have some abelian group. So forget model theory for now. Uh, assume you have an abelian group uh, and consider the relation uh, given by the graph of addition. So whenever I say graph of addition, I, I mean something like this. So x1, one, one uh, the sum of x1 through xr is equal to zero in G. Okay. Now uh, it's easy to see that this relation uh, satisfies the following two simple properties for any permutation uh, of its variables. So the first one is that when I fix all but one coordinates, I only have a, a unique choice for the remaining coordinate. Yeah. Uh, and the second one is that whenever I fix uh, a pair, some pair of coordinates, let's say x1, x2, then for any two tuples uh, corresponding to the remaining coordinates, if I have that uh, my relation holds on x with the first tuple and it holds on x with the second tuple, then uh, the fibers given by those two tuples, y and y bar, are the same. So it's kind of saying that the sum factors through x plus y. Okay, all right. Uh, and so what we show is that um, a converse exists, uh, assuming r is greater or equal than four. So for r equals three, this is uh, not, not a meaningful statement. Okay, so uh, the theorem is assume r uh, is at least four. Assume we have a uh, relation r. So these are just arbitrary sets, x1 through xr, and r is an arbitrary relation. So just find these two properties for any permutation of the variables. Then there exists an abelian group and coordinate wise bijections. So sending xi to this group, such that uh, the relation is exactly the sum of, uh, of uh, the results of applying this bijection to the coordinates. Yeah, the condition that it equals to zero, excuse me. Uh, moreover, uh, if uh, the original sets xi and r are definable, uh, or type definable in some uh, in some structure, uh, well, somewhat saturated, I guess we need a bit of saturation, then uh, the corresponding group G is also uh, type definable in that structure. And uh, the way this result is applied in the minimal case is that uh, we obtain this property as P1 and P2 uh, on certain infinitesimal uh, neighborhoods. Uh, and then we can apply this purely combinatorial result. Okay, just a remark. Uh, so uh, after, after the fact, we noticed that there's actually some connection to an existing notion. So this property P1, uh, in the case when all the sets Xi are the same, uh, turns out to be equivalent uh, to a certain notion uh, of being a R minus one dimensional permutation uh, or a latent R minus one hypercube. Uh, so this is a notion that was studied uh, by Lineal and Luria. And uh, then what this result says is that our condition P2 characterizes uh, those uh, latent R hypercubes uh, that come from an abelian group, that come from addition in an abelian group. Okay, oh, and, and like I said, yeah, the, if, if the initial data is type definable somewhere, uh, then uh, the results are also definable in the same structure. Okay, so this is the result that is needed for the minimal case of the theorem, of our theorem. Uh, for the, now let me say a couple of words about the stable case. Uh, so in the stable version, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we only get a generic correspondence with the type definable group. Uh, so let, let us call, uh, let us say that an argon is a tuple of R elements, A1 through AR, such that any R minus one of these elements are forking independent, but uh, any element is in the algebraic closure of the remaining ones. And uh, actually, as I learned recently, this is called loops, uh, essentially called loops in, 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 in Matroid theory. So this is an object existing in Matroid theory. Um, so, and we will say that uh, such an argon is a billion if it satisfies this condition, which is essentially a local version of uh, modularity or one-basedness one uh, for stable theories. Uh, 
So it's exactly this notion of modularity, uh, standard notion of modularity in, in one base theories, uh, sorry, in stable theories, but localized uh, just to this tuple. Yeah, we are not discussing mm, theory as a whole. So sometimes local, local modularity, where the two words local have different meanings. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, and then uh, what we show is that, uh, oh, so first of all, again, like in the previous example, um, if we have a type definable abelian group in a stable theory, uh, we can pick uh, R minus one independent generics uh, and take the product as the remaining as the last element, uh, and we get uh, an abelian ergon of this form. And uh, turns out that conversely, uh, generalizing the abelian group configuration of Khrushchevsky, one can show that uh, uh, given such an abelian ergon, uh, one can uh, find uh, a type definable abelian group uh, for which this argon uh, is given by this uh, is, is an interalgebraic coordinate wise interalgebraic with a generic ar uh, argon for this group. And uh, this result uh, again was obtained by Khrushchevsky in some unpublished work actually. Um, yeah, so this is the result, the group reconstruction uh, type theorem that is used in the stable case of our theorem. Um, now, uh, let me say a couple of words about the second ingredient, distality, unless there are some any questions about this. Um, okay. okay, so actually, it, it, yes, I have a question about that. Yeah. Uh, so is the uh, does the proof of this of this theorem just reduce to the group config, the usual group configuration theorem in stable theories, or is there some other idea that has to go into it? So, so yeah. So what we did actually is we um, generalized the proof of 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 of, of the group configuration theorem, but uh, in Udi in Udi's work uh, he does reduce it to the to the group configuration theorem in some form in some way. Can I ask, also ask another question? So. The bow that you get over here probably is not an effective bow because we don't have the mirror detractor. Bound have, where, uh, sorry? Uh, so in, in this result, do we get a bow, an effective bow like in your earlier result in the minimal setting? We have bounds in both cases, in the minimal and in, uh, stable with digital expansions. But ah, in the oh. stable case, uh, the bound depends on uh, how well we understand the stability of the expansion. But I'm going Thanks. to say actually something about this in, in a second. Thanks. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, yeah, so distality. Uh, so this is a notion that was introduced uh, by Pierre Simon uh, in the context of uh, classification of an IP series. Uh, and uh, here I present an easier definition, which is uh, actually we prove that it's equivalent to that with Pierre uh, at some point. Uh, so this is the easy, probably the easiest way to define it in a purely uh, uh, combinatorial way. So we will say that a structure M is distal if uh, for given if I give you any definable family phi uh, parameterized by this parameter B uh, of subsets of uh, the structure. Then there is a definable family theta uh, of x c, where this theta depends only on phi, such that for any uh, element a and every finite set b, we have the following two conditions. So first is that a realizes uh, some instance of this formula theta with the parameter c in b, and two that this theta in fact decides all the phi uh, properties uh, of this element a with uh, parameters from B. So uh, maybe let me draw a picture to illustrate it. So I have a finite set B, for example, B1, B2, etc. finite, and I have some element A. And what I want to understand is um, if I fix a parameter B and I look at the corresponding set phi of XB, and I want to know if this element A is in the corresponding set or not, okay? So I have a bunch of sets, it belongs to some, maybe it doesn't belong to some others. Uh, and uh, what the condition says is that then we can find some small set theta of XC containing my point where the parameter C is a tuple from the same set moreover, such that this set theta completely uh, specifies all of the sets phi in this family. So uh, somehow it is contained in every uh, instance of phi, which contains my point A, but uh, doesn't uh, intersect any of the phi's which don't contain A. 
Okay. Uh, so it's some kind of generalization of where. Yes. I have a quick, yeah. quick question because uh, distality originally was defined by Pierre in NIP theory. So, how is it NIP related to your definition here? So this this implies NIP. Ah, okay. And uh, in NIP, it's equivalent to the usual uh, to the usual. So this we proved with Pierre. Okay. That it's equivalent to the usual definition with indiscernibles. Great, thanks. Which I'm not going to present here because yeah, it's not. Uh, sure. But yeah. So it's a more infinitary definition from which it's actually hard to see any connections to combinatorics, I think. Okay. Um, right, so this is the notion. A couple of uh, examples and non-examples. So first, oh yeah, this is what I just said. So this digital implies an IP, uh, and moreover, it implies unstable. Uh, some examples of digital structures. So uh, all structures where there's a nice cell decomposition uh, witness this condition, as is not, actually not hard to check usually. Uh, so for example, weekly or, or minimal structures satisfy it. Uh, various valued fields of characteristic zero satisfy it. Um, uh, for example, QP, uh, RCVF, etc. cetera. Uh, now, uh, a, a very curious question is actually understanding which stable structures have digital expansions. Because uh, the properties of distality, which we're interested in, are going to transfer to uh, Redux, unlike distality itself. Uh, so some examples are given by algebraically closed fields of characteristic zero. This is why this uh, our theorem, for example, applies to, uh, to, to, the, to the field of complex numbers. DCF zero, CCM. Uh, and the last two are uh, unpublished results uh, with Pierre Simon. Uh, which we, uh, for example, show that uh, Khrushchevsky constructions have distal expansions. Uh, so I put a star here, so let me uh, specify it a bit more precisely. So what we know is that the uncollapsed version of, of uh, Khrushchevsky's ab initio it and its variants uh, has an actual distal expansion. But for the collapsed version, uh, we know that uh, somehow it's locally distal. So we don't have an actual distal expansion, but we know that it satisfies all the combinatorics. Um, formula by formula. Yeah. OK. Uh, and uh, a couple of known examples, so stable structures without distal expansions, are given by uh, fields of positive characteristic. And this is actually an important point, which somehow separates fields of positive characteristic and fields of characteristic 0 with respect to these uh, um, results, Elike Sabote results. Uh, and uh, there are some other examples, more recent examples, which don't involve fields, uh, are finite expander graphs. Mm, for example, Raman Jan graphs. So this is the result of Jank, Nisetriel, Asonia de Mendes, and Sieberts. Uh, so in fact, some amount of expansion seems to, to uh, certain regime, expansion regime seems to explain uh, failure of distality. Uh, an open problem, very interesting open problem, I think, is whether not abelian free groups have distal expansions. So this is open. Uh, we checked actually with the research cleaners that um, uh, it's quantifier free distal, but uh, of course, in general, it's a much more complicated um, uh, question. Yeah. So I think it's, a, it's an interesting question. OK. Um, oh, OK. And so my, my point of presenting some of these examples and non-examples uh, was to suggest in which cases you can you get an analog of the uh, Elikir Sabo, general Elikir Sabo. Uh, so for example, in the case of Khrushchevsky constructions, you get, uh, since there are no definable groups there, so you get uh, actually pure expansion, that there's always uh, power saving for arbitrary definable relations. OK. Um, so now, how is distality used? Uh, so it's used uh, because it's possible to prove certain generalized incidence bounds for structures with distal expansions. Um, so here it's a very basic combinatorial, classic combinatorial statement. Assume we have uh, an R hypergraph. So we have again R sets, like X1, for example, X2 through XR. And we have uh, an R relation uh, between them. Okay, E, uh, and assume that this relation does not contain a complete uh, uh, a, a complete subgraph. So what do I mean by this? So a subgraph is complete if, uh, for example, for k r equals two, it's complete if we have all possible edges. Yeah. So assume there's a, 
uh, it doesn't contain um, uh, such complete uh, subgraphs for some fixed uh, small uh, size. Okay. Then, if we look at sufficiently large graphs of this form, we will see that there is uh, a, a, some non-trivial trade-off on the exponent. So, of course, the maximal number of edges would be n to the r, yeah, because uh, if we had all possible uh, edges. Uh, but if so, uh, some small, uh, uh, so if locally complete graphs are forbidden, then globally we get a, a bound on the number of edges. So here, this bound is also. Uh, known to be qualitatively essentially optimal. So you get a little bit uh, better than the maximum possible, but uh, you can't do much better generally. This is a probabilistic uh, construction of Artyosh. OK. Now, uh, the way distality is used is that it allows to get a significantly better exponent uh, for this uh, counting procedure. Uh, so. Uh, this is a theorem of uh, myself with uh, David Galvin and Sergei Starchenko, where we generalized the semi algebraic case uh, of Fox, Pach, Schechter, uh, Suk, and Sal. Um, so assume M is a distal structure, and uh, assume we have a definable relation R. Then there exists some epsilon positive, uh, such that for any pair of uh, finite sets of size N, so you should think about n as growing uh, uh, as large, yeah. Uh, if uh, compared to k, compared to little k. So if uh, we look at the graph induced by this definable relation on an arbitrary pair of finite sets uh, of points, then and if it uh, it is k k k free, then we have a bound on the number of edges which is strictly better than the basic bound. That I presented on the previous slide. Yeah, I don't want to spell it out. Of course, it's more explicit, but uh, we get some non-trivial improvement on the basic bound uh, for the exponent. Uh, now uh, we have again, like I said, we have estimate on this epsilon uh, in terms of uh, the size of the distal cell decomposition for this relation. Uh, so something uh, like the way I defined it: the smallest possible uh, number of parameters in theta gives some estimate. Uh, for, for, for the cardinality of this. Uh, and in the result, now in the electric sub theorem, this epsilon here is going to exactly convert into the power saving in the non-group case of the, of the main theorem. Yeah. So this advantage over the basic bound is exactly what makes, uh, makes that gap in the non-group case. Uh -huh. In some cases, we have more explicit bounds. For example, in the case of a minimal structures, uh, we have uh, an optimal bound uh, for relations um, on uh, the plane, uh, which is for thirds, which is exactly the bound in the semi-reddit rotor uh, incidence bound between endpoints and endlines. Uh, yeah, so it is recovered from this very general principles, in fact. Uh, and okay, and this case, the minimal case was obtained independently by Basu Ras also using different techniques. But uh, yeah, but for the minimal case, there are also now bounds in higher dimensions, uh, not necessarily optimal, but um, yeah. OK, so we have this uh, power trade-off, which, which is exactly what provides uh, the power gap in the case of, um, uh, in the case of uh, stable structures with digital expansions, as well as a minimal, actually. Yeah. So this incidence counting applies to both cases of the theorem. OK, um, so now let me move on to the second uh, uh, illustration of how this, uh, this bounds, uh, this exponents for asymptotic growth of intersections of definable sets with uh, finite grids can reflect uh, some algebraic structures. Um, so let's return for a second to this uh, point line incidence relation, uh, relations, sorry, that I've just mentioned. So this is uh, semi-reddit rotor. Uh, basically, so this just says that the semi rotor theorem is uh, optimal. Uh, so what it's saying is that if I have, um, for example, V1 is the set of n points, and V2 is the set of uh, n lines on the plane, on the real plane, then it is possible to find configurations uh, on which the number of incidences uh, is uh, n to the power of four thirds. So this is both the upper bound and up to the constant, it's also a lower bound in this uh, particular case. Okay, 
Now, uh, in particular, it is nonlinear, of course, we can see, yeah? for sources greater than one. So to define, uh, to define this example, we use both addition and multiplication. So to define the internet structure, we need both addition and multiplication. Uh, in other words, we're using the, the there is an underlying field structure. And uh, again, so our next result is that it is not a coincidence uh, and that any non-trivial lower bound on uh, such uh, uh, exponents uh, allows to recover a field in the minimal setting. So let me say this in the minimal structures. It's a bit more general, but let me focus on the minimal uh, situation here. So assume we have uh, M, some minimal structure, and assume we have a definable relation R of R at little R, uh, such that this relation is, uh, again, is uh, locally doesn't contain uh, small, um, complete uh, uh, induced hypergraphs, okay? Assume, on the other hand, that the bound is not, um, of the form uh, n to the power r minus one. So of course, the uh, let me return for a second back. So uh, like I said, in the general case, if there are no assumptions on the hypergraph, uh, structural assumptions on the hypergraph, then what we get is r minus something very small. So this is n to the power r minus epsilon. So it's very close to r typically, the maximum possible bound, okay? So here we get, in the distal case, we get a little trade-off away from the maximal bound, but here we are saying, assume it's not all the way down to R minus one. So assume it's not minimal. <laughs> yeah, assume it's slightly not uh, best possible. Um, then a real closed field is definable, just using the order in this uh, relation. So in the reduct down to this relation, uh, a field is definable. Okay, so we can recover a field from any instance of non-optimal count. Uh, what are the ingredients of this result? Uh, so we have two, it combines two things. So the main new ingredient uh, is uh, an almost optimal bound on the number of edges in uh, KKK free hypergraphs, which are definable in locally modular or minimal expansions of groups. And uh, the field then is recovered using the trichotomy theorem for minimal structures uh, of Petersdil and Starchenko. So let me say a couple of words about uh, the incidence bound. So, uh, oh, and sorry, I should have said, so this is, theorem is a joint work with Abdul Basit, uh, Sergei Starchenko, Terence Tao, and uh, Chomin Tran. Yeah. Okay, so, um, let me just re remind uh, what uh, what do we mean by uh, local modularity here? So if I have a, a nominal structure, we can consider the closure operator given by the algebraic closure. And uh, this leads us to a natural definition of dimension, uh, something uh, generalizing, for example, the transcendence degree uh, in algebraically closed fields. Uh, and this also leads to a notion of independence, yeah? generalizing independence in vector spaces or uh, in uh, fields. And uh, in any minimal structure, this notion of independence uh, is a, a, actually a matroid. So it's a, it's a nice, well-behaved notion of independence. Now, uh, local modularity uh, is formulated in terms of this notion of independence. Uh, as a way to express that it behaves uh, much more like uh, independence in vector spaces as opposed to, for example, algebraically closed fields or, or real closed fields. So in a minimal structure is uh, weakly locally modular. So let me omit this weakly, it's a techni technical, there's a little technical distinction there. So weakly locally modular. If, I, if I'm given any pair of subsets, uh, then after changing the base, so after adding some par extra parameters, possibly independent from everything, we get uh, the usual modular independence. So A is independent from B or the intersection of the ACLs after naming some new independent constants possibly. Okay, this corresponds to the usual notion of um, uh, modularity for minimal structures in the sense that any normal family of plane curves has dimension uh, one with most one. Um, so again, note that this modularity enters the picture here explicitly again, like earlier in the uh, abelian group configuration result. So, and then we have the following bounds. Uh, 
So assume M is a non-minimal uh, locally modular expansion of a group, Q a definable relation of variety at least two. Then uh, the first part, so for any epsilon and any finite grid, n by n by n by n grid, vi, if you look at the intersection uh, of our definable relation with this finite grid, and if this intersection is kkk free, then we have the bound on the number of edges, okay, which is almost r minus one. So there's some little epsilon which can be made arbitrary small, but essentially it is uh, almost r minus one. And moreover, if uh, the relation Q itself is KKK free, so globally, yeah? so in, in, the, in the first case, we are not requiring Q to be KKK free. We're only uh, looking at those grids such that intersection with them is KKK free. But in the second case, if the whole relation is globally KKK free, then we can even get rid of this epsilon. So we get the full uh, trade off um, of the power. Okay. So now, uh, recovering the field, uh, so let me recall that uh, the trichotomy theorem. So if M is a non-minimal saturated structure, then M is not locally modular in the sense I just defined, if and only if there exists a real closed field definable in M. Okay, so and here's just an example, more explicit example in the semi algebraic case maybe, when you have a semi algebraic but not semilinear set. So now combining this uh, field reconstruction well, the theorem, combining the, the theorem with uh, the optimal bound in the locally modular case, uh, we, 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 conclude the, we conclude the result. Interestingly enough, it's very hard actually to see the, uh, unlike the group case where we had very explicit correspondence between our relation and uh, the graph of addition in an algebraic group, here it seems very hard to actually <laughs> get any explicit connection between uh, our relation with too many edges and the point line incidence relation in the field. It would be very interesting to, find, to have any kind of, again, like a, a more explicit correspondence between the two, but this might be very difficult because it seems to lead actually to some well-known long-standing problems in combinatorics, like the unit distance conjecture, et cetera. So, uh, so it would be very interesting to get any more um, uh, explicit local version of this um, result, more cl closer to the, to, the, to the version for groups. And uh, let me just make a couple of remarks also about one uh, corollary of this, uh, which uh, is of independent interest. So this is not really model theory anymore, but uh, since this uh, incidence topic is somehow uh, plays, plays prominent role in this kind of results. So we have an application of this uh, semi-linear bound uh, to incidence problem. So assume we have um, a bunch of um, uh, half spaces, H1 through HQ, and we can consider the family of all polytopes, uh, which are cut out by translates of these finitely many half spaces. Yeah, so I have a bunch of half spaces, uh, and then I'm allowed to move them wherever to get various copies of this. Um, then uh, we have a bound on the number of incidences between points and uh, polytopes from this family. Uh, for those graphs which are KKK free, we get an almost linear bound. So we get a bound of the form n log n to the power q. So this is that n to the power one plus epsilon. So the epsilon from the previous slides uh, is actually of this form. So it's just like some additional logarithmic factor, some power of a log. Um, one particular one corollary, which was actually part of the motivation initially for that project, was to understand a very simple incidence problem. The number of incidents between points and rectangles with axis parallel uh, sides. Yeah. So, uh, and it, it tells that it's almost linear up to some power of log. Now, this power of log, we know it is needed. So, I'll, I'll, I'll just enter this slide. So, we know that some power is needed unavoidably. And in fact, the construction that we provide for this turns out it answers some, some existing questions in, 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 in combinatorics also. Um, but how much uh, it, how much of it is needed is actually again open. We don't know. So in particular, we don't know if uh, you consider, for example, uh, incidences with uh, boxes in R to the D. If we let this dimension D grow, uh, we don't know if the power of log has to grow again. So this seems to be uh, this seems to be difficult. 
um, remaining open problem. Okay. So uh, yeah, so this has some 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 applications uh, in incidence combinatorics, and let me end uh, here. So thank you very much. Thank you, Artyom. So are there questions? <laughs>